So uh, we're here to worship the Lord, and uh, he calls us to worship. A reading from Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us, that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all the nations. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. Let's stand with all the peoples. And if you're able, stand. We will praise our God with singing holy, holy, holy. kids, any of the children that are here, or if you feel like a child today, can y'all, y'all come up, come on. How you doing? You guys doing good? All right. Well, today, we're going to talk about there was a king a long time ago, like 3,000 years ago. Before your parents were born, a long time ago, and they called him Pharaoh. That's what he called himself. And he was kind of a mean guy. You probably know this story, don't you? Maybe. He, the people, Moses said he wanted to take the people of Israel out to the wilderness to worship God. And God, God said, take, take the people out to worship God and tell Pharaoh that you want to take them. Pharaoh's not going to let you go. I mean, he didn't. Pharaoh wouldn't let him go to worship. He was, he was a mean king. So God was merciful. God gave him a warning. He said, look, if you don't let my people go, I'm going to send a plague. You know what a plague is? It's something, with, it's something really nasty, and it takes all kinds of forms. One of the plagues was he sent frogs on the land. Frogs. The Bible says frogs were everywhere. Frogs were, frogs were in people's beds. How fun would that be to go to bed at night and pull back your sheets and snuggle up to a nice slimy frog? He said frogs were in the kneading bowls. You know, kneading. Does your mom make?
homemade bread? Does she ever make homemade bread? You grin. <laughs> okay. Well, if she did, she'd have a, l a lump of dough and she'd put it in a bowl, it's called a kneading bowl, and she would squeeze it and knead it for a few minutes and then cover it up and just let it sit before putting it in the oven to bake. He said frogs got in the kneading bowls. So imagine if she got the, the, the ball, it's been sitting in the bowl, she takes the cover off and there's a bunch of frogs in it. Or even worse, what if she got that loaf and the frog had sunk down in and put it in the oven and baked a frog in your loaf of bread? How cool would that be? I've got some scones here. You think there might be a frog in one of these scones? I hope not, because we're going to about, about to sample one. Okay, you want to take that, take that first scone? Okay, let's see. Okay, break it open for me. Let's see if there's a frog in it. No, no frogs. Okay. Well, you can eat that. You want this one? There you go. Break it, break it, see if there's no frog. No. Can I have some? All right, we'll just, we know there's no frogs in these scones, so we're, so we're good to go. Yeah, not a bit of frog in that scone. But, the thing is, we, now you all have a king. Sorry about that, I almost spit a piece of scone on you. We, you all have a king, and he's a good king. And he lets you worship. And right here we are today, worshiping. And that's a great thing. I'm glad you're here. And we're going to continue worshiping because our God deserves it. So, hope you enjoyed your scone. Was that okay? You can scarf that down pretty quick. So, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're a merciful God. Even in circumstances that seem harsh. You simply want to be worshipped. It's what you deserve. So we thank you for the privilege of worshiping. Thank you for the joy that we can have in worshiping. We give the rest of this service to you, our dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, thanks, guys. I think the teacher will take you now to the Sunday school. It's amazing how much a single scone will stick in your, comes out everywhere. Those are good though, wow. The story that we're going to be looking at today uh, in the Exodus is a, is a powerful one. Um, and it's appropriate that we prepare ourselves with a time of prayer. So at this point I'd like to ask Kalen, welcome him back from the far reaches of Glasgow and ask him to come and pray with us. Thank you, Brian. It's wonderful to be back. Let's begin by praying then, shall we? Lord God, we thank you so much for this time that we've begun and will continue to go through. In, uh, in your words, in the book of Exodus. Father, the book of Exodus, we know, teaches us so many things, and it shows us so many wonderful things about your character. And this morning, in the sermon, and also as we pray now, we want to reflect on two of those aspects of your character. First, Father, that you are an almighty God. You are stronger than any forces in this world, be they human in the shape of a pharaoh, or be they physical in the shape of these plagues or anything else. You are above and beyond them all. Father, we also remember this morning in prayer that you are a rescuing God. Lord, we know the book of Exodus is a story of rescue. Father, we thank you that you rescued you people from slavery back then. And even to today, you are still rescuing your people from slavery, a different kind of slavery, 
slavery to sin and to the law. Father, your apostle Paul reminds us in the book of Galatians, formerly when we did not know God, we were slaves to those who are by nature not God's. Lord, we reflect ruefully now on the fact that our lives often prove this fact. Our mistrust in you, our pride in ourselves, and our resentment for those around us. In the quiet of our hearts, we bring these sins before you now. Father, in light of this, we want to thank you so much, so earnestly for Exodus's reminder that you are your people's rescuer. You rescued Israel from sin then, and you rescue us from those sins we've just reflected on now. And so the Apostle Paul is able to say, we are no longer slaves, but God's children. And since we are also your children, we are also your heirs. Lord, we pray that this truth would be so precious to us, that it would be something that we cherish day and night. And may the hope it gives us spur us on to live for you, lives bearing the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Father, we've reflected on the fact that you are our rescuer, but we also know that you are the rescuer of the whole world, and specifically those who do not know you yet. Father, this makes us think of the many in Murray and on our doorstep here in Elgin who do not know your son yet. Father, as you performed miracles for Israel to rescue them from Egypt and in our lives to rescue us from our sin, so, Lord, we ask that you would miraculously be rescuing many in Murray. Especially, Father, this week we think of these upcoming craft evenings. Lord, we thank you so much for all the invites issued. And we pray that many who do not yet know you would come along. We pray especially for Emma de Paula as she prepares her talk. Lord, we ask that by your spirit you would be with her. Help her to communicate clearly the hope that there is in Christ Jesus. That though there is enslavement to sin and death, he offers us rescue in his death and resurrection. Father, may this truth not fall on deaf ears, but on soft hearts. May many see the joy and the hope on offer in Jesus and be saved. So, Lord, this week at these craft evenings, we ask for a plentiful harvest, 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold of what was sown. Father, in this prayer, we began by reflecting on the fact that you are a rescuing God, but also that you are an almighty God with power and authority over all the forces in this world. And at this time when we think of our world's need for this, our mind cannot help but be drawn to the ongoing war in Israel and Palestine. Father, the situation there is so complex and developing so quickly that it is hard for us to know how to pray. Nonetheless, Lord, we echo the words of your prayer that you taught us. May your will be done in Israel, Palestine, as it is in heaven. Specifically, Father, we ask that you would be limiting and stopping the evil and the suffering. Father, we ask that you would protect and guard the weak and the innocent. And you would be with the various leaders, be they Netanyahu right at the very top of Israel, or the military leaders uh, of the various parties involved. Lord, may they not be governed by prejudice and hate, but may they be guided by justice and restraint and a concern for the weak and the needy. Father, we also pray for your church, which has found itself caught in the crossfire at this time. May you protect and guard them. And may the knowledge of your love and the fellowship of the worldwide church give them hope in this bleak time. So, Father, again, in Israel-Palestine, we reiterate the words of your prayer. 
May your will be done in Israel, Palestine, as it is in heaven. Amen. Indeed, may God's will be done. Please stand if you're able. We'll, we'll sing Psalm 34, um, speaking of the angel of the Lord surrounding and guarding continually. Please stand. The angel of the Lord surrounds and guards continually. All those who fear and honor him, he sets his people free. Come taste and see, the Lord is good, who trusts in him is blessed. Oh, fear the Lord, you saints with need, you will not be oppressed. Young lions may grow weak and faint and hunger for their food. But those who wait upon the Lord will not lack any good. Come here, my children, gather round and listen to my word. And I will help you understand how you may fear the Lord. Ask Please be seated, and I'll ask Gavin to come read for us. Although the sermon's on chapters 7 to 11 um, of Exodus, don't panic, I'm just reading chapter 7. So. And that can be found on page 63 of the Church Bibles and also on the screens. I'll just read verse 30 of chapter 6 just for connection. But Moses said to the Lord, Since I speak with faltering lips, why would Pharaoh listen to me? Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. You are to say everything I command you, and your brother Aaron is to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of his country. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt, and with mighty acts of judgment I will bring out my divisions, my people, the Israelites, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded them. Moses was 80 years old, and Aaron 83 when they spoke to Pharaoh. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when Pharaoh says to you, perform a miracle, then say to Aaron, take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh, and it will become a snake. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron threw his staff down in front of Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a snake. Pharaoh then summoned the wise men and sorcerers, and the Egyptian magicians also did the same things by their secret arts. Each one threw down his staff, and it became a snake. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Yet Pharaoh's heart became hard, and he would not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is unyielding. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning. As he goes out to the river, confront him on the bank of the Nile, and take in your hand the staff that was changed into a snake. Then say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to say to you, let my people go, so they may worship me in the wilderness. But until now you have not listened. This is what the Lord says, by this you will know that I am the Lord. With the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water of the Nile, and it will be changed into blood. The fish in the Nile will die, and the river will stink. The Egyptians will not be able to drink its water. The Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, Take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the streams and canals, over the ponds and all the reservoirs, and they will turn to blood. Blood will be everywhere in Egypt, 
even in the vessels of wood and stone. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded. He raised his staff in the presence of Pharaoh and his officials and struck the water of the Nile, and all the water was changed into blood. The fish in the Nile died, and the river smelled so bad that the Egyptians could not drink its water. Blood was everywhere in Egypt. But the Egyptian magicians did the same thing by their secret arts, and Pharaoh's heart became hard. He would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. <laughs> Instead, he turned and went into his palace, and did not take even this to his heart. And all the Egyptians dug along the Nile to get drinking water, because they could not drink the water of the river. This is God's word. We have we've heard God's word read. Uh, we'll be I'll be preaching here in a minute, but for now, let's stand and we'll sing as we meditate on God's word through song. With me thy servant in thy grace Deal bountifully, Lord That by thy favor I may live And duly keep thy word Open mine eyes that of thy law the wonders I may see. I am a stranger on this earth. I'd not thy laws from me. My soul within me breaks and doth much fainting still endure through longing that it hath all times unto thy judgments pure. My comfort and my heart's delight Thy testimonies be, and they in all my doubts and fears are counselors to me. Thank you. Please be seated. So, we're familiar with the story, if, if not from the Bible, then from Disney or Hollywood, uh, God uses Moses to confront Pharaoh. He visits, just a moment please, he visits ten plagues on the Egyptians, and we're, we've read about one of them. Uh, here, are, here are the rest. Everybody loves a good chart, at least I do. The, on the top row, we've got all 10 plagues here. So on the top, the, the gray, those are the plagues listed. Uh, it's actually two charts stacked one on top of each other. So on the top row, plagues one through five. The second chart, plagues six through 10. And uh, a couple of notes about each plague, and we'll, we'll speak to that. Basically, the plagues, but there are some things in, in common with all of them. Uh, we will be, the lessons to be learned in, in the aggregate, and we'll be referring to those different plagues So, uh, from time to time. So I would recommend if you, if you uh, have a, a Bible with you or you can grab one of those in the seats in, in front of you, uh, open it up, open to page 63. Uh, We've got five chapters, so you may have to flip a page here or there. But we'll be referring to the different plagues, uh, and it'll just be a matter of flipping a page or two, but the pattern is the same. God uses his chosen instrument, Moses, to confront Pharaoh, who is the personification 
of evil. So it'll be instructive to see how evil presents itself. What kind of a man is Pharaoh? And what kind of a God is our Lord? And what kind of people ought we to be in response? Those are the headings in your service sheet if you, and there's room to take notes there if you so desire. But this is God's word, so let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, open our eyes that we may see what you will teach us from your word. Lord, may the words of my heart, may the words of my mouth, may the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So what kind of a man is Pharaoh? I'm going to select some of his more, he's obviously the bad guy here, and I'm going to select some of his more egregious attributes. And again, they come out in various ways in the different plagues, but I, the one that really strikes me is this habit he has of false repentance. <coughs> Excuse me. False repentance. He, and, and, he does it, and he does it twice. I think I've got them... Uh, listed here, the, the ones, yeah, seventh and the eighth plague, it's that, that bottom row there that's highlighted in orange, he, he, uh, he, he, re, he repents, he says he's sorry. Uh, chapter 9, if you turn to chapter 9 and uh, verse, verse 27 and 28, So we're in the plague of hail. God has sent a plague of hail on the land that it's... By the way, all of these plagues are over the top. It's not, there's nothing that happens today that would be... There are some nasty things. If you've uh, I've had some... There's some videos you can watch online with plagues of locust, and they, they are pretty bad. But... But nothing like these, and, and the hail here, it killed the animals, it, it broke down the trees, it was, it, and it was accompanied with lightning uh, that apparently struck the ground again and again. So it says in verse 27, then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron, this time I have sinned, he said to them, the Lord is in the right, I and my people are in the wrong, pray to the Lord for me, we've had enough thunder and hail. I will let you go. You don't have to stay any longer. He, he sounds like a, like a primary school child who's been caught, caught in the act. I won't do it. I promise. I won't do it. But then five or six verses later, verse 35, Pharaoh's heart was hard, and he would not let the Israelites go, just as the Lord had said through Moses. He, once the hail, once the pressure was taken off, he changed his mind. The lesson from this is that Everybody is sorry when they get caught, from children to serial killers. Uh, that's no reason to withhold punishment. Here's the thing that I, I think I've said this before. True repentance doesn't complain about consequences. There needs to be just punishment for the offense to fit the offense, but true repentance will agree with that, with that punishment. So first of all, false repentance. The second thing, he, again and again, Pharaoh tries to make God's people compromise and also there's several examples but I'll just take one uh, verse uh, chapter 8 chapter 8 verse 25 Pharaoh's bargaining with uh, with Moses and uh, he says if Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron he said go sacrifice to your God here in the land now Moses has said, God wants us to go out into the wilderness and worship him. And Pharaoh says, do it here. Do it here in the land. And of course, Moses says, I can't. You know I can't do that because your people, your people hate us. But apparently, the shepherds were odious to the Egyptians. And uh, so, you know, Moses says, I'm not going to do that. We're, we're going to go, we're going to go out into the wilderness. So in verse 28, uh, Pharaoh says, I'll let you go to offer sacrifices to the Lord your God in the desert, but you must not go very far. Now pray for me, right? He, he, he's just trying to bargain because in this case, he wants the flies 
to, to be taken away. He, and he has no integrity. Again, verse 32, but this time also Pharaoh hardened his heart and would not let the people go. So he, he, he makes the offer, tries to let's compromise, and then, he, and then he backs off of his offer. Now, as we think about God making, or Pharaoh making God's people compromise, it is, it's true, we live in a world um, ruled by men and women who, in many cases, don't fear God, and they have no concept of basic biblical ethics now, here in the UK, uh, in America, we, we, we're far more blessed than most. Uh, we've, there, there's a lot of countries in the world where, where people just don't trust their leaders at all, uh, where people quake with fear if they see a policeman because they, they reach for their wallets. I'm going to have to bribe somebody. Uh, we, we're, we're, we've been spared that so far, but still quite often our government, our institutions, make rulings that are not in keeping with biblical ethics and following them goes against biblical principles and uh, our reaction needs to be addressed but, but, but not today. This is not, that's not what is in view here. Exodus is not a case study in church-state relations. It's a, it's a picture of the epic struggle between good and evil. God's deliverance of his people from Egypt is a type of God's act of salvation. Again, if I don't, probably if I don't say that once a sermon while we're on Exodus, I'm not doing my job. We, that, that's, that's absolutely critical. And the, the message is, so this is a picture of our struggle with sin. And the message is we can't compromise with sin. And I'm not talking sin in the abstract, sin out there. We're talking sin in here. The, this struggle with sin is a life or death struggle for the believer, for the follower of Jesus, the child of God. We must be ruthless with sin in our own lives first. Not in our neighbor, not in our friend, our spouse, in our hearts. We need the courage to say, and this is a, this is a really hard prayer, but we need the courage to say, Lord, look at my heart and take away everything that doesn't look like Jesus. That it, it scares me when I think of praying that prayer because I'm, I guess I'm afraid there's, there's just too much, too much there in my own heart. I know my own heart. And it's going to be some major surgery for God. But, but it's worth it. I believe, and I believe that God has his people here in this town, and I believe they will be attracted to a place where they see God's word making a difference in the life of his people. This is something that we really need to, to get serious about in our own lives. And now let me also clarify. This idea of getting right with, with God, of, of being conformed to the image of Christ, it does only apply to those who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus for their salvation. Um, when we, I, I was speaking to a young man on, on uh, was it Tuesday? No, it was Friday. It was a young man on Friday. And, and he said, invited him to church, and he said, I need to straighten out my life uh, before I come to God. And, and I, I mean, and people, people answer you like that. They say, I, I need to get right first, and then I'll come to God. It doesn't work that way. Right? I, need to, I need to straighten out my life. You know, how are you going to do that? I mean, you're the one that got you where you are in the first place. It just, it, the, the math doesn't add up. Uh, we come to Jesus as we are with the promise that he won't leave us that way. Jesus says, come to me, you who are weary, who are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. We have heavy loads, and he gives us rest. So, uh, you know, if that hasn't happened in your life, you need to get that right, coming to Jesus first. You need to place your faith and trust in Jesus for salvation. And then you can say, as I would urge us to say, Lord, look at my heart and take out everything that doesn't look like Christ. He delights to answer that prayer. So back to our main point. We've looked at what kind of man Pharaoh is. What kind of God is our Lord? Well, first of all, he's the great God 
over all creation. He, in, in, in these plagues, in these 10 plagues, every element, uh, the, the fire, air, earth, water, every, all of creation is involved. All kinds of animals, there's, there's beasts, cattle, cattle creeping things of every kind. Even the spirit world is invoked. Darkness, the ninth plague of darkness, darkness is a, is a, is a picture in the ancient world of, 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 of spiritual oppression. And we'll read about it next week, but, but the, uh, the death of the firstborn is done at the hand of an angelic being, of a spiritual being. So if we were going through the plagues one at a time, we would see that each one, uh, they speak in detail uh, of Egypt's pantheon. So I'll just say in passing that each one of God's plagues is an, is an intentional affront and mockery to some god of Egypt. The Egyptians had dozens and dozens and dozens of gods. It, it's, it's actually brilliant how they work out. There's a lot of, there's a lot of again, irony and sarcasm. Uh, and, and God handles it. So God is the God of creation. He, the other thing is God knows the beginning from the end. In chapter 7, where we read, uh, God, God says, chapter 7, uh, verse 3, he says, But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my miraculous signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt, and with mighty acts of judgment, I will bring out my divisions, my, uh, my people, the Israelites. Now, God didn't stand back and say, let's see what happens. Right? In, in every plague, the pattern is like this. God tells Moses exactly what he's going to do, and then he tells Moses exactly what Pharaoh's going to do, and then he says what he's going to do about it. So God calls the shots every step of the way. It's, it's a worthwhile exercise to read chapters 8 through 11 and just see how God is, without a doubt, the one calling the shots. He is able to accomplish all his holy will. And, and I, I do want to address something here. Uh, bear with me. <clears throat> There's this issue of the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, right? God says in, in verse 3, uh, in chapter 7, verse 3, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And sure enough, in verse 13, Pharaoh's heart became hard. And it's like that through all the, th throughout all the narrative. Uh, and looking on the slide here, that the, uh, the bottom row. Uh, so the row that's uh, highlighted in blue and the one below that's highlighted with blue and red. The blue is, and I've as closely as possible quoted from the text, blue is where it says Pharaoh's heart was hardened or Pharaoh hardened his own heart, and red is where it explicitly says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Okay. So you've, got, you've got, both, got both things going on. It says God hardens Pharaoh's heart, and it says Pharaoh hardens his own heart. And I, the question is going to come up, uh, if God hardens Pharaoh's heart, how can God punish him? Right? He's the one that made his heart hard. Is, so is God unjust? And of course the answer is an emphatic no, but, but how do we justify that? Again, this is something, if, if you haven't been asked this already, uh, you're, uh, if, if, if you've got uh, children, nieces and nephews that are going to college, they're going to get confronted with it. This is a, this is a common objection. Now, I've heard all kinds of creative resolutions, uh, and some of them get sort of esoteric. They, God's not bound by time. He's outside of time, which is true. He looks at time from a different perspective than we do, uh, and what he sees what's going to happen, and so he, he calls out the shot. I don't find that particularly satisfying because it puts God in a passive role. It's, he's just watching the world unfold. And another tack is to say that, that God let Pharaoh do what Pharaoh wanted to do. 
God just confirmed what Pharaoh wanted to do. Again, that puts God in the role of spectator rather than the driver of what happens in the world. Uh, I was checking out some, some commentaries. One of the more creative resolutions was that hardened, the word hardened can be translated twisted. So the picture is that God, God twisted Pharaoh's heart like wringing out a rag. And of course, what comes out of the rag is going to be what's soaked, what it's soaked in. So if it's got sweet water, it's going to come out sweet. And if it's got lemon juice, it's going to come out sour. Again, that just kind of kicks the can down the road. Uh, couldn't God made, God's the one that made Pharaoh's heart. You know, why did he make it sour instead of, instead of sweet? I, I think I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to pretend to solve this issue today. And, and in fact, I, I want you all to be comfortable with the fact that it leaves you uncomfortable. Because here's the thing. We look at the text. The Holy Spirit didn't have to tell us that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. It, we, I mean, reading the story, you can see that Pharaoh becomes progressively and pro more and more just irrational. He, he is a classic case of a man who is just digging in in his stubbornness. If that isn't hardening of a heart, I don't know what it is. It's obvious in the story. But the Holy Spirit seems to go out of his way in, in recording this to very deliberately tell us that two things are happening. That Pharaoh hardened his heart and that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. He tells us that both things are going on. So what I want to do is just to keep us out of, there's the, going down the road and keep out of the ditches. There's a ditch on either side. On the one side is the ditch that says that man is, is, is captain of his fate and he makes his own reality with unbridled free will. That's, that's, that's the free will ditch. The other ditch is that God's sovereignty, God's exercising his will, amounts to fatalism. And God runs the universe and that our input is meaningless. That's the, that's the other ditch. The Bible insists that two things are true. God is sovereign. He hardened Pharaoh's heart. And man is responsible. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Now, I know that's uncomfortable, especially for, for those of us who like our theology in a nice, neat package with a bow on top. But the Bible insists that we live with that discomfort. Here's a, here's a quote. The Most High God does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? That's from, that's from Daniel, chapter 4, verse 35. Those aren't the words of Daniel. Those are the words of a pagan king. Nebuchadnezzar, who at this time had apparently bowed the knee to the God of Israel. Those are the words, Nebuchadnezzar knew a thing or two about sovereignty, about exercising his will and having it, having it happen. And this is a man who says, God is absolutely sovereign. There at the end, none can stay his hand. He is absolutely sovereign. If he... If Nebuchadnezzar had, have, had, had read this story, he would have said, if God wants to harden Pharaoh's heart, that's his right. But the Bible also says man is responsible for his actions. I'm sorry, that's really small print. <laughs> so, uh, but this is Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage? Why do the peoples plot in vain? Here it is. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. This is, this is free will on steroids. The kings of the earth saying, cast off all restraints. We're going to do what we want. And here's God's response. O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. He's saying, you guys make a choice. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son lest he be angry. That's God's comeback is... You guys make a choice. And then, and then here at the end, he says, Blessed are all who take refuge in the Son. God makes it clear that, that people have a choice. And then here's the beauty. He promises blessing to those who choose wisely. 
Does that make us uncomfortable? Yeah, I, I get it. I get it. But at the end of the day, it leaves us with the knowledge that, yes, we are responsible before God for the choices we make. Absolutely. And it tells us that God is on his throne. He's not letting the world get out of hand, regardless of what our news feeds on our phones tell us. I don't know about you, but I'm okay with that. So, again, back to my point. Uh, what kind of God is Yahweh? So we're, we're back. He, he is able to accomplish all of his holy will. Again, chapter 7, uh, verse 20. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded. He raised his staff in the presence of Pharaoh and his officials, struck the water of the Nile, and all the water was changed into blood. So God says what he's going to do, and he does everything he says. You know, one of the problems with familiar stories is that we, we become immune to the, to the wonder that, that's in them. This is, an, this is a miracle that happens in front of credible witnesses. You have Pharaoh, and you have his, his courtiers and magicians, and the last thing they want to see is, is Moses' is God showing them up. But they can't, they can't refute it. They can't refute that this miracle has happened. The best they can do is imitate it, and, and pathetically, they turned, they turned some water into blood. Oh, boy. But I guarantee you it wasn't like turning the Nile to blood. And not far, where, not far from where Cheryl and I live in St. Louis, the, the Mississippi River is almost a, a mile wide. And so probably about the size of, of where the Nile, of the Nile, where Moses would have been. And I can't fathom that whole body of water turning to blood. And the other thing, and it flows. So as it says, you, you never stand in the same river twice you 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 get in new rivers coming down all the way and for that whole thing to turn into blood it it's often been noted it would have been a lot more useful if the magicians had taken some blood and turned it back into water but all evil can do is imitate god satan can't create anything the the best he can do is pitiful perversions and imitations of god's work he, he does that to us and he does that in his, in, his, uh, in his world. So God offers the real deal in all aspects of life. But we have to surrender to him first. I know that sounds frightening. But God is merciful. And that's our next point. Even his judgment is merciful. Uh, chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 15. This is in the midst of the, uh, of the plague of hail. God, God tells uh, Pharaoh, well, he told Moses to tell Pharaoh. He says, for by now, I, God, could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with a plague that would have wiped you off the earth. But Pharaoh, I have raised you up for this purpose, that I might show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. God could have summarily wiped out the Egyptians. It was the greatest empire of its time. With all, uh, archaeologists say that the pyramids of, of Giza, this is the, the pyramids of Giza complex, the pyramids of Giza were about a thousand years old by the time of the Exodus. So with all apologies to Hollywood and Disney, but the Israelites didn't, didn't build these pyramids. But this was the civilization that Pharaoh was in charge of. And God's saying, I could have wiped you out one, one flick of my finger. But, but here's his thing. God has a desire that his name be proclaimed in all the earth. And who's going to do that? Who's going to proclaim God's word, God's name? Us. That's us. And it gets to the question then, what kind of people are we? And I think the pivotal reference is, is in... Uh, chapter 7, Exodus chapter 7, verse 4. God says, I will lay my hand on Egypt, and with mighty acts of judgment, I will bring out my divisions, my people, the Israelites. God describes his people as divisions. 
Some, some translations say, I will bring out my host, or I will bring out my army. I actually like the NIV's rendering of divisions. Uh, host is a, we've kind of forgotten what host means, the old, that old English word that speaks of an army on parade. Uh, but, but divisions makes no bones about the fact that this is, is an allusion to a military formation. So what does this have to do with us? Well, in the time of the Exodus, God's people were the ethnic nation of Israel. Today, God's people are all those who profess faith in God's Messiah, Jesus, what our reformers refer to as the church invisible. And that's not a, the church invisible, that's not a specific institution, but it's all those who throughout history have put their faith and trust in God's Messiah, Jesus. And God styles that church, this church, our church, as an army. And Jesus goes farther, farther, or is it further? Someone can correct me afterwards. Jesus goes farther, further, and he says he's, it's an army that's on the attack. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus refers to Peter's great confession that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and he says, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, gates are defensive weapons. In, in, the gates are defensive. In the ancient times, a city would close its gates when it was under siege. So the picture here is of the kingdom of Satan under attack by the church of Jesus. We are an army on the offensive. We don't attack with guns and tanks. Our weapon is the gospel of reconciliation. The news that people are alienated from God and can be reconciled to him only through Jesus. So God's continually revealing himself to the world and eventually he will do it via judgment but in the meantime he's doing it through his church and it will take time. We need to be a people who are patient. We often think the plagues happen one after the other in rapid succession but in fact it likely took at least nine months we're not told that explicitly, but, but the ancient readers, as they were reading it through the text, would have caught the clues. We know when the Exodus happened, and we'll learn that next week. There's actually a date given. And we're given markers through the text, things like what crops were being harvested during certain plagues. A Middle Eastern reader at the time would have, would have simply done the math. So God's people got to watch the whole thing. And in the first four plagues, you can see on the, the bottom, the white, that they, they probably suffered along with the Egyptians. But those, those highlight, plagues highlighted in green, by that, by that time, there was a point that, that uh, well, I'm sorry, the, the point is that God's deliverance is a process. They did suffer with the Egyptians for a time. And it takes times in our own life, God's sanctification, which is why the apostle says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, because it's God who's at work in you to will and to work for his good pleasure. Interestingly enough, here's a verse which speaks openly about that, that tension between our responsibility to work out our salvation with fear and trembling and God's sovereignty, God works in you to will and to work for his good pleasure. The Bible insists that both are true all the time. So we're an army. We are patient. We are fighting over the long haul. And we've already talked about being serious about our faith, of asking Christ to conform us to his image, to look in our hearts and take out anything that doesn't look like Jesus. And it helps that process to get with other believers to, to help one another along in life, to pray for one another as we look at God's word. Small groups, great way to do that. I love it that so many of you are, are able to participate. Um, if you're able, I just I, I could extend, continue to extend the invitation. This craft evening coming up, um, it's a great time to just enjoy life together. Uh, men will be doing some things, so, uh, so stay tuned. We're not as good at the ladies as, as just hanging out, 
uh, but stay tuned, there are, there are things in the works. Let's be a people who are serious about pursuing God in our own lives so that it spills over into our vocations, our family relations, our citizenship, working to the glory of God wherever he's placed us. And, and let me say, there's, there's genuine worship of God going on here. Uh, it's, it's been just over two years that Cheryl and I first visited this church. And, and that's one of the things that attracted us. Good preaching, the word preached, good music and hymnody and psalms, powerful prayers, uh, proper uh, execution, uh, proper administration of the sacraments. This is a place where people can anchor into the past, get guidance and sustainment for the present and the future. We have what a hurting world needs. Let's enjoy it ourselves, and let's invite others to join in. Please pray with me. Gracious Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your strong arm, your strong hand and your outstretched arm. Father, you show yourself to be Lord and Master of all, a God who is certainly worthy to be worshipped. But you're a God also who pursues his people, who desires to be worshipped by his people. Father, we thank you for the privilege of giving you that worship. We pray that we would continue to do so. We pray your blessings. I pray your blessings upon this church. Lord, I pray your blessings upon this city. Would you draw your people out? Would you draw them to yourself? I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to close with uh, singing a song. Uh, oh, Father, you are sovereign. And uh, Please stand if, if you're able. Please receive the Lord's benediction. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before his glorious presence with great power, to the only God our Savior, be glory, honor, and dominion now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen.